know how important containers have become in today's fast moving IT world. Pretty much every big organization has moved out, out of their traditional approach of using virtual machines and have started using containers for deployment. So it is now the good time that you should understand what is Kubernetes and its architecture because that is what is used in containers, right? So hello everyone, this is Sahiti on behalf of Edureka and I welcome you to this session on Kubernetes architecture. So thank you all the attendees for joining in today's session. Before we get started, all of you just give me a quick confirmation on the chat window whether I'm audible or not. Okay, I've got many yeses, so that's great. So now let's get started with today's session. So first let's look into the topics for today's session. We'll start today's session by understanding what is Kubernetes and then we'll discuss the Kubernetes architecture. After we are done with that, we'll understand the components for master and worker nodes and then we'll discuss what cluster state management is. And finally, I'll end the session by telling you the network setup requirements for Kubernetes. Alright, so is the agenda clear to everyone? Okay, so that's great. So now let's move on with the session. So what is Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is a container management tool. Kubernetes is an open source system for automating deployment, scaling and management of containerized applications. It groups containers that make up an application into logical units for easy management and discovery. So now that you know about Kubernetes, let me tell you a few features about Kubernetes. So Kubernetes is designed on the same principles that allows Google to run billions of containers a week and that shows that Kubernetes can scale without increasing your operations team. Whether testing locally or running on a global enterprise, Kubernetes flexibility grows with you to deliver your applications consistently and easily no matter how complex your application is. Kubernetes is an open source which gives you the freedom to take the advantage of on-premises, hybrid or public cloud infrastructures and lets you effortlessly move workloads to wherever it matters to you. Kubernetes also automatically places containers based on the resource requirements and other constraints while not sacrificing availability. It mixes critical and best effort workloads in order to drive up utilization and even save more resources. So it performs resource optimization. There is no need to modify your application to use any unfamiliar service discovery mechanisms since Kubernetes gives containers their own IP address and a single DNS name for a set of containers and then it can also load balance across them. It automatically mounts the storage system of your choice whether from local storage or a public cloud provider like GCP or AWS or even a network storage system like NFS, ISCSI, Cluster, Ceph, Cinder or Flocker. Kubernetes also restarts the containers that fails and replaces and reschedules containers when the node dies. So it kills the containers that do not respond to your user-defined health check and doesn't advertise them to the clients until they're ready to serve. Not only this, but it also deploys and updates secrets and application configurations without rebuilding your image and also without exposing the secrets in your stack configurations. In addition to the services, Kubernetes can also manage your batch and CI workloads replacing the containers that fail. So, we can say that Kubernetes progressively rolls out all the changes to your application or its configuration while monitoring the application's health to ensure it doesn't kill all of your instances at the same time. If something goes wrong, Kubernetes will roll back to the change for you and thus it takes the advantage of growing ecosystem of deployment solutions. So guys, that was all about Kubernetes features. So now that I've told you so much about Kubernetes features, Let's look into the architecture of Kubernetes. So, Kubernetes architecture has mainly three components. The master nodes, the worker nodes and the distributed key value stores like ETCD. Talking about the master node, the master node is responsible for managing the Kubernetes cluster and it is the entry point for all the administrative tasks. So we can communicate to the master node via the CLI or GUI or APIs. So for the fault tolerance purposes, there can be more than one master node in the cluster. And if we have more than one master node, then there would be high availability mode and only one of them will be the leader performing all the operations. All the other master nodes would be the followers of that node. Also, to manage the cluster state, 
Kubernetes uses etcd and all the master nodes connect to it. So etcd is a distributed key value store which I'll tell you in a little while. Also, let me tell you that the key value store can be the part of the master node and it can also be configured externally and in that case, master nodes would connect to it. So now that I've told you what a master node is and what are the responsibilities of the master node, let's discuss the components of master nodes. So a master node has mainly four components, the API server, the scheduler, the control manager and etcd. So now let me tell you about all these components one by one. So starting with API server, all the administrative tasks are performed via the API server within the master node. A user sends the REST commands to the API server which then validates and processes the request. After executing the request, the resulting state of the cluster is stored in the distributed key value store. After that, we have scheduler. So as the name suggests, the scheduler schedules the work to different worker nodes. The scheduler has the resource usage information for each worker node and also knows about the constraints that the users may have set. Before scheduling the work, the scheduler also takes into account the quality of service requirements, data locality, affinity, anti-affinity and many other such parameters and then the scheduler schedules the work in terms of pods and services. The next component that we have is controller manager. Now what do you think are the responsibilities of controller manager? Well, as the name suggests, controller manager manages different non-terminating control loops which regulate the state of the Kubernetes cluster. Now, each one of these control loops know about the desired state of the object it manages and then they watch their current state through the API servers. Now, in a control loop, if the current state of the object it manages does not meet the desired state, then the control loop itself takes the corrective steps to make sure that the current state is same as the desired state. So what does the controller manager do? It basically makes sure that your current state is same as the desired state. After that, the last component that we have is etcd. So as I mentioned earlier, etcd is a distributed key value store which is used to store the cluster state. So either it has to be a part of the Kubernetes master or you can configure it externally. So guys, that were the various components of master node. Now, let's move on to the next component of Kubernetes architecture, that is the worker node. A worker node is a machine or a virtual machine or any physical server which runs the applications using pods and is controlled by the master node. So you understand the master slave concept. It has its own machine, but yes, it is controlled by the master node. Now pods are scheduled on the worker nodes which have the necessary tools to run and connect them. So you can say that the pod is basically the scheduling unit in Kubernetes. It is a logical collection of one or more containers which are always scheduled together and to access the applications from the external world, we have to connect to the worker nodes and not the master nodes. So now that I've briefed you about the worker node, let's discuss the various components of worker node. So a worker node has mainly three components the kubelet, the kube proxy and container runtime. So let's start the discussion with container runtime. So a container runtime is basically used to run and manage a container's lifecycle on the worker node. So some examples of container runtimes that I can give you are the container, RKT, LXT, etc. Now it is often observed that Docker is also referred to as container runtime. But to be precise, let me tell you that Docker is a platform which uses containers as container runtime. Alright, so now that you've understood what container runtime is, let's move on to the second component that is kubelet. So kubelet is basically an agent which runs on each worker node and communicates with the master node. So if you have 10 worker nodes, then kubelet runs on each and every worker node. Then it receives the pod definition via various means and runs the containers associated with that pod. It also makes sure that the containers which are part of the pods are healthy at all times. So what does a kubelet do? It basically runs in all the containers. It makes sure that your containers which are part of various pods are always healthy at all times. So the kubelet connects to the container runtime using the container runtime interface which consists of various protocol buffers, gRPC APIs and libraries. So as you can see on the screen, 
the cubelet connects to the CRI shim to perform containers and image operations. Now, CRI implements two services that is the runtime service and the image service. The image service is responsible for all the image related operations while the runtime service is responsible for all the pod and container related operations. So these two services have two different operations to perform. Now let me tell you something interesting here. Container runtimes used to be hard coded in Kubernetes, but with the development of CRI, Kubernetes can now use different container runtimes without the need to recompile. So any container runtime that implements CRI can be used by Kubernetes to manage pods, containers and container images. So now let me give you an example of a CRI shims. So Docker shim and CRI container are two examples of CRI shim. With Docker shim, containers are created using Docker installed on the worker nodes and then internally Docker uses container to create and manage containers. With CRI container, we can directly use Docker's small offspring containers to create and manage containers. So these were two simple examples of CRI shims. Now let's move on to the third component of worker node that is kube proxy. So kube proxy is the network proxy which runs on each worker node and then listens to the API server for each service point creation or deletion. So for each service point, kube proxy sets the route so that it can reach to it. So guys, that were the components of the worker node. So now let me move on with the session by discussing the third component of Kubernetes architecture that is etcd. So as I mentioned before, Kubernetes uses the etcd to store the cluster state. So etcd is a distributed key value stored based on the raft consensus algorithm. So the raft allows a collection of machines to work as a coherent group that can survive the failures of some of its members. So basically this algorithm works in such a way that even if some of the members fail to work, it can still work. At any given time, one of the nodes in the group will be the master and rest of them will be the follower. As I told you before in the starting of the session that there can be only one master and all the other masters have to follow that master, right? Not only this, but let me tell you that etcd is written in the Go programming language. Besides storing the cluster state, etcd is also used to store the configuration details such as the subnets and the config maps. So now that I've told you so much about Kubernetes architecture, you must be wondering, right, what could be the network set of challenges while working with Kubernetes cluster? So let me tell you the network set of challenges that you may face. So you have to make sure that you have assigned a unique ID to each pod and the containers in the pod should be able to communicate with each other. If they do not communicate with each other, then you will face the network challenges. Not only this, but you should also make sure that the pod is able to communicate with the other pods in the same cluster. And also, you should make sure that the application deployed inside a pod is also accessible from the external world. So now that you know the network set of challenges, in a situation suppose you face these challenges, how are you going to solve these challenges? You can solve these challenges by assigning a unique IP address to each pod by making sure that the container to container communication inside a pod is working absolutely fine. You can also make sure that the pod to pod communication across nodes is fine. And also finally, the application deployed inside a pod is accessible from the external world. So let me tell you about each of these ways. So starting with the first method, that is assigning a unique IP address to each pod. So Kubernetes uses the container network interface to assign the IP addresses to each pod. The container runtime offloads the IP assignment to the CNI, which is nothing but the container network interface, which connects to the underlying configured plugins like the bridge or MacLevin networks to get the IP addresses. Once the IP address is given by the respective plugin, CNI forwards it back to the requested container runtime. Now moving on to the second method, that is container to container communication inside a pod. Now with the help of underlying host operating systems, all of the container runtimes generally create an isolated network entity for each container that it starts. On Linux, that entity is referred to as the network namespace and these network namespaces can be shared across containers or with the host operating systems. So inside a pod, containers share across the network namespaces so that they can reach to each other via local hosts. Now the next method is pod to pod communication across the nodes. So in a clustered environment, the pods can be scheduled on any node. 
we need to make sure that the pods can communicate across the node and all the nodes should be able to reach any pod kubernetes also puts a condition that there shouldn't be any network address translations while doing the pod to pod communications across the host and you can achieve this by routable pods and nodes using the underlying physical infrastructure like the google kubernetes engine and also use the software defined networking such as fanel weave calico etc and finally the last method that i mentioned was communication between the external world and pods so in the last method you just have to make sure that the application deployed inside a pod must be accessible to the external world as with kube proxy we expose our services to the external world so that we can access the applications outside the cluster also right so guys these were the four methods through which you can solve your network challenges and that was all about kubernetes architecture so guys that's all for today's session i hope you found this video informative thank you and have a great day i hope you have enjoyed listening to this video please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to edureka channel to learn more happy learning